So Amazon and Ava Labs have a great partnership because uh, we help them with emerging crypto companies or developers that need compute power and storage for Amazon Web Services. Amazon Web Services has a large swath of existing users, obviously, one of the largest you know, cloud service providers, and they introduce us to traditional enterprises that want to deploy blockchain-enabled solutions. So it's a very synergistic relationship. This content is brought to you by Uphold, which is a great crypto platform that I've been using since 2018. Uphold has all the top cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin and all the altcoins. In fact, they have 260 plus cryptocurrencies on their platform. You can also trade precious metals, stable coins, and 37 fiat currencies. In addition, they are available in over 150 countries. And this platform is fully reserved. They do audits. So you can trust that your funds are safe. No commingling, no lending out your funds. If you'd like to learn more about Uphold, please visit the link in the description. Welcome to the Thinking Crypto Podcast. With me today is John Wu, who's the president of Ava Labs. John, it's great to have you on. Hey, it's great to be here. I love your work. Thank you, John. And John, I'm a big fan of Avalanche. I'm an AVAX token holder in full disclosure. So I'm excited to be speaking with you today and learn about all the great things you guys are doing at Ava Labs. Uh, let's start with your background, though. Where are you from and what's your professional background? Sure. Uh, born and raised in the New York area. Um, I think uh, something interesting about me growing up is well, I was one of those kids that loved sports, but was equally happy just, you know, being the first kid on the block to buy a laptop or a PC and, and do very basic coding in my house. Um, so I can go either way. And I love both sides. Um, you know, literally love playing sports. I love the fact that it was community based and teamwork, but I loved also innovation and, and, uh, coding, you know, in basic back then. I was a very basic, it's a basic language, but it's also called basic. And, uh, professionally, you know, I was an economics major in college and I went to Wall Street. I was at, various hedge funds and private equity firms, and I was a tech investor. So that was my first career, studying emerging trends in technology. And one thing that I was pretty good was is identifying uh, the future technologies earlier than hopefully most people and getting in ahead of the wave, similar to the way I saw uh, the crypto and Bitcoin world happening in the 2010s. Mm. And what was your first encounter with Bitcoin and what was your aha moment? I think there were two aha moments. Uh, I first learned about it uh, roughly 2011 and 12 ish time period. And I went to a whole bunch of meetups. Uh, it was really Bitcoin only back then. And um, frankly, I wasn't convinced. Um, there were a very interesting cast of characters at all of these meetups. Uh, that wasn't necessarily who I was. Uh, but, and I frankly did not know, you know, having a traditional finance background and learning how to value companies and, and exploring the TAM of a new technology, I couldn't figure it out for Bitcoin, frankly. Couldn't do a DCF on it, basically. Hmm. And then it was not until like 2014 after Mt. Gox when the thing crashed again, Bitcoin crashed again, that I revisited it. And um, at that point, I realized, you know what? Stop looking at this like a company. Think mm -hmm. about it as a commodity or maybe even a currency. And then just do a supply and demand analysis like someone would do for commodities. And back then, there were like only 15 million Bitcoin in existence. So the mining, you know, uh, hasn't gone to the where it is today. And um, I did the incremental supply times the price at the time. Mm. And I also was counting addresses on the demand side and making minimal assumptions for a uh, dollar per address. And it was so clear to me that with the most minimal um, assumptions, incremental demand was far greater than uh, the incremental supply being unearthed on a give, any given day. So I knew that this thing whatever it is, is going higher. That's when I really first got into it in 2014. And then the next aha moment was actually 2017. You're an old hat, so you probably remember the ICO boom, CryptoKitties breaking down, you know, Ethereum. So 
I had done my share of, you know, uh, as an investor, IPOs, fundraises, and et cetera, et cetera. When I saw how eloquent and how quick and how cost effective a global crowdfund could be in an ICO raise, I was, that was the first time I realized, well, I can actually use this technology for a use case. Mm. And I was then on a mission. Basically, uh, my first gig in the space as an operator was at a place called Shares Post. We were trying to tokenize private securities. Um, and then we mentioned CryptoKitties. And then, but what I realized while we we're doing it, even though we made it regulatory compliant with the ATS um, and all that stuff and do a change of membership with the ATS working with SEC and FINRA, the problem was the world wasn't ready for it and the technology wasn't ready for it. Hmm. Um, and I had known uh, Dr. Eamon Gunsir, who was trying to solve a lot of the technology scaling issues at the time. Um, you know, he and his PhD students at Cornell. I did my cor undergrad at Cornell. So we had known each other for some time. And, and I realized that from a business perspective, the, the technology in the space needed to get better. And he actually created an, uh, an unbelievable consensus protocol, Avalanche that does scale, that is fast, and that is still secure, the trilemma, if you will. And um, that's when um, I joined, and it was uh, about four plus years ago now, 10 of us in a room, and I'm happy to report we're a successful company at Ava Labs with over 240 and um, working on changing the way the world works. And what makes the Avalanche blockchain different from others? There are so many blockchains out there, right? And many who are competing against each other. But what makes Avalanche stand out? So let's separate. Avalabs is the team. Mm -hmm. um, and that, it's a software services company helping others build on top of Avalanche. Mm -hmm. Avalanche was created by you know, Eamon Gunseer or Dr. Eamon Gunseer or Gun as I officially call him. But Avalanche today is a permissionless layer one open source network or blockchain. And that is, has its own, it's a nonprofit governance board, et cetera, et cetera. So what difference Avalanche first, before I talk about Avalabs, what difference Avalanche, frankly, very simply is it's damn fast and it's very scalable in plain English. So the, the speed of it, because of the consensus protocol that Gun developed, is basically allows it to basically have instant finality. So settlement and payment happens at the same time. Super mm -hmm. valuable in so many different aspects. And then the architecture of the chain is such that it scales what I call in a horizontal manner. So we call it subnets, but think of them as networks on top of other networks, mm -hmm. the Avalanche network. Using the Avalanche consensus, you can create your own custom blockchain. You can make it permissionless or you make it you know, private if you need KYC AML, if it's a traditional finance related. But they are very interoperable with the, all the subnets or networks with each other. And they are interoperable with the, the main chain of Avalanche. I think those two distinct characteristics really is what makes Avalanche the blockchain um, phenomena and distinct. Now you mentioned uh, it's a very scalable, and there was news that uh, there's a uh, there was a proposal recently to help the transactions per second reach one hundred thousand. Tell us about that initiative. Wow! So you're you're up to speed on everything. This is part of our uh, roadmap and pipeline. Super excited for what we call a uh, uh, VRICS, and between VRICS and what we call hyper SDK, it will allow subnets to transact at 100,000 TPS. Mm. So RIX is a parallelization, if you think about it. It eliminates a lot of valueless transactions, so it allows transactions to go through in a better way. Hyper SDK allows you to create your own virtual, uh, uh, you know, a, a better virtual machine, a faster virtual machine. The two of them in combo with a third thing called Firewood, which is a storage uh, a solution, will allow these subnets to really, really be uh, fast. Mm -hmm. Like I said, 100,000 TPS. Now, but I'm glad you got to that because that's yeah. going to happen very, very shortly. Yeah, that's exciting. Um, and I don't know if there's any other blockchains that are on that level which 
can maintain uptime. <laughs> Put that caveat out there. Yeah, I know, given what had happened last night, but yes, totally. Um, um, but uh, not so just so people will know there was a blockchain out there that couldn't uh, went down last night, not Avalanche, to be clear. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I'm sure many will see the headlines. But um, tell us about the AVAX token and the staking capabilities there. Okay. So first, I want to take a step step back because when people talk about staking, it's almost like they only treat it as a financial services component. It's mm -hmm. actually when you're staking, you're validating, you're running infrastructure, whether it's hardware or software or both. And what it really is, is it's kind of like in the old days in the internet world and ISP, you're helping secure and you're helping run the existing technology. So I want to make that point clear because when people think about staking these days, all they think about is um, the, the financial component of it. Mm. But what staking an avalanche does that's interesting is that not, um, not only are you staking to secure the avalanche network, but all of these call it subnets, subnets or app chains or you know um, network chains, whatever you want to call it, you can set your own requirements for staking, your own gas fees. Your, your, it's, it's your own execution environment, and you can make it composable to the way your um, desire based on your application. So what's interesting here, again, is you're not just helping out Avalanche, making Avalanche more secure, but when you're a developer on one of these app chains, you can set your own staking for your own subnet. Uh, mm -hmm. rules that is so it's a very flexible system and i think it benefits everyone yeah that's that's really great and tell us a bit about the use cases that you're targeting and i know some of this is uh ongoing right every business every blockchain uh and so forth is looking for additional adoption and ways to expand their footprint but what are the core use cases that you're targeting maybe it's working with institutions or whatever it may be so Earlier, we talked about the unique aspects of Avalanche. We didn't get to the team at Avalabs, the software services team that tries to build on Avalanche. I think one of the unique characteristics of Avalabs is really the people. What I mean by that is you have world-class visionary technologists like Gun and a whole bunch of great technologists from Cornell University. And then you have people like me who've built out the business side of it with, you know, close to 30 years of commercial experience, both investing in technology companies as well as working in technology companies. Mm -hmm. And Ava Lab's mission has always been more than just create uh, a unbelievable crypto native ecosystem. That is very, very important to us. But the other mission and in, in, in my own personal mission is to create use cases for traditional Web2 companies or TradFi. Mm -hmm. So um, when you say what is going on or what will happen on at Avalabs or Avalanche, there's two components to it. On the crypto native side, the ecosystem is flourishing. Um, we're talking about Last year in 2023, we had 100% growth in addresses. Um, right now, I think there are, and this combines both, but there are about, you know, somewhere like 20 plus live subnets. There are another 80 plus in the testnet environment that will go live this year. Mm -hmm. um, developers now, even Elliptic uh, 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 Capital, I think is the name of the company that writes, you know, about developer counts have noted that Aval developers on Avalanche have grown 500% in the last three or four years. So a lot of development happening, a lot of dApps coming on, a lot of developers coming on, and it's a thriving ecosystem. Um, that's on the crypto native side. Mm -hmm. Then on the, call it, uh, crossover side, Web2 to Web3 side, or TradFi to DeFi side, so many exciting things happening. I think there are three areas, if I can summarize it. One, in the very short term, there are a lot of AAA gaming-type companies and gaming tooling like Merit Circle um, creating subnets on Avalanche. These are companies that have raised, these are AAA publishers that have raised 70 million plus to develop a game and they're going to launch a healthy component of that on a subnet their own subnet in avalanche so i think on that side some point this year you're going to see 
a big hit in one of these games because these are publishers who've had experience with big hits in traditional, and that will be driving a lot of usage into Avalanche. Another area, we already talked about traditional finance. Most recently, we announced the Sandbox effort with JP Morgan, Apollo, uh, in the Sandbox of uh, Monetary Authority Singapore. So just to summarize that one, um, that is really cool, actually, because what it's doing is it's creating interoperability between private chains and permissionless chains. So and then tokenizing alternative assets. In this case, it's the HELOC loans on figure provenance and making it interoperable. Um, and I think Christine Moy from Apollo really said it well. And because you're doing it this way, you're taking 3,000 processes and reducing it to one automated one while you save 20% on fees doing this. And what that ultimately means is RIAs will be able to um, configure their portfolio in a way that's far more flexible and easy and increase alternative assets like HELOCs or funds and provide access to individuals to things that they never could have got access to if they want to invest in that. So that's happening in the TradFi. There'll be many more similar types of uh, announcements coming down soon. And third, um, I think this is the year, um, and I wish I could name the names, but we're in some big brands where no people no longer think about NFTs just as digital cartoons. Um, mm -hmm. You're going to see functionality, whether it's Fi digital. In fact, we learned, you know, the uh, the wallet with the block uh, right blockchain solution is actually a great CRM tool. Mm -hmm. um, it is a way for uh, brands to stay engaged with their consumers. Literally, one brand said, "As soon as that doll leaves Walmart shelves, I lose connection with that uh, user." So, having a Fi digital aspect to it allows them to continue to engage. And it saves them on sales and marketing. They don't have to reacquire that customer through Google or Facebook for advertising. So instead, they can manage their experience themselves. So those are three areas in what I call the crossover side that are super exciting to me. You know, let's talk a bit about that uh, customer experience. So are you envisioning that, let's say I walk into Walmart and there's a certain toy that I want to get for my six-year-old. Um, maybe on that toy, there's a QR code that says, can, um, get additional experiences or unlock certain features with an NFT, scan this QR code to learn how. Is that kind of the start of the journey? And then let's say it's running on Avalanche. And uh, uh, Absolutely. You're, you've nailed it. That'll be the equivalent of like, okay, you bought a Barbie doll and, <laughs> and then all of a sudden the Barbie movie comes out and you are able to engage with that you know user and say, hey, go to... Um, you know, AMC or Regal or whatever cinema. And then once they're there, you can um, create in movie experiences and gamify the whole thing and make the whole experience of owning that Barbie doll better. But at the same time, um, you have their information and you're able to customize solutions based on the age and, and age appropriate and also interest appropriate type of experiences for that person. Mm -hmm. um, it's a win-win for everyone. And I'm assuming it would be the, the the retailer that I go to, their app, but Avalanche is running in the back of that app, powering the NFTs, uh, but also can be with all the retailers as well. Correct. There's many ways to do this. Um, in fact, you know, as that landscape plays itself out, there is kind of a um, give take right now, whether if it's the movie theaters app in this example, or whether it is Mattel who does, you know, Barbie and they have the engagement or wow. they have a partnership and work together. So that is still playing itself out. But regardless, Avalab provides technology solutions on Avalanche. So we will customize it to any way they want. Mm. Now, I did want to ask you about the JP Morgan uh, item that you brought up where they're uh, testing the tokenization of assets on Avalanche. Um, you know, is that in the piloting testing phase? And, you know, what else can you share there as far as production? I don't know if you can. Um, yeah. this year. Um, Hi, everyone. Pardon the interruption. I'm Tony Edward, the founder and host of the Thinking Crypto podcast. I have a huge favor to ask you. If you haven't subscribed as yet on YouTube or the podcast platforms, hit that subscribe button, hit the thumbs up button, hit the notification bell on the YouTube platform and on Spotify or Apple or wherever you get your podcasts. 
please leave a five-star rating and review. It supports the podcast. It allows me to bring great quality content to you. Thank you for your support, and I'll let you get back to the content. It is in the sandbox of Monterey Thoris Zero, so it is in the testing phase. Um, there are other things that we're doing with all of those constituents, more assets um, and, and more players coming into that um, call it ecosystem, but that's in progress. So it's slowly happening. In fact, it's very similar to how we have created a, another functionality, which is also a testnet environment called Spruce. Mm -hmm. So Spruce testnet has Wellington, T Row, and Wisdom Tree, and they are tokenizing assets. And it's also other partnerships like with Ave, with um, uh, and, and AMM like Trader Joe. So it provides. DeFi-like experience in an institutionally compliant way. So it, you know, the um, it's a private chain only in the sense of KYC, AML, and accreditation, as opposed to um, private in the traditional technical sense. Now, speaking of tokenization, and and obviously this is a big use case. Do you think moving forward, this is the killer use case for? blockchains in addition to other things right there's other use cases but this is the major one where you know you got blackrock larry fink talking about this um and they're looking to put stocks bonds real estate on it and create fractionalization in global markets and secondary markets and more DeFi capabilities yes and yes and yes um so let me start is this the killer use case you know tokenization is not just tokenized existing assets it could be tokenizing new business models, new anything that has a cash flow or value to it. So, you know, the 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 value of that data of that person with the Barbie doll, that's an, a different type of example. But in terms of how it relates to JP Morgan Financial Institution and TradFi, I think the first real product market fit out there has been tokenizing stable coins or currency mm -hmm. or money markets, if you will. So, you know, Brevin Howard did this research, I think last year, there was more settlement on chain of tokens in stablecoin format than there is in the Visa network, over 11 trillion a year. So there is real product market proof out there. In fact, in the US, we are spoiled because the financial systems and rails are pretty good. So when we're doing P2P, we're Venmoing each other. But there, if you go to like, you know, Latin America, go to other places around the world, their version of Venmo is stable coins back and forth to each other. Mm -hmm. And it is just a more eloquent solution than a Venmo. In fact, Venmo owned by PayPal, actually, it's funny because PayPal Corporation owns PayPal wallet and, and, and the Venmo wallet. If you, Anthony, wanted to send money from one wallet, Venmo, into your own PayPal wallet, they actually, the corporation of PayPal has to actually go outside of their own walls go through a third party because they, they bought in Venmo, the tech stacks are so different, and then charge themselves. So if you move $100 back and forth, they, you see $100 back and forth, but it really costs PayPal, I don't know, a penny, two pennies to actually do that whole thing, maybe even more, and they are eating the cost for you. So part of the reason why PayPal is doing the PayPal USD is because they want to solve some technology uh, problems and create more efficiency. So that's a perfect example of tokenization in stable coins already taking off. The next step is what you just said about, you know, what we're working on with tokenizing alternative assets of, you know, HELOCs or, you know, we tokenize part of a KKR fund and possibly the tokenization of more money market funds, not just BlackRock. Others have also done this, uh, Franklin Templeton, for example. So um, tokenizing repos, and, uh, you know, Broadridge has done this with, you know, uh, SockGen and some other European banks where they've saved millions and millions of dollars. 1.4 trillion go through the Broadridge system uh, a month in terms of easier settlement. So there is a ton of things happening in the tokenization of various financial products. I think it's harder for the average person to see because it is more of a B2B function and they haven't seen that chat GPT generative AI aha moment to the individual, but B2B it's happening. Mm. And speaking of the B2C aspect of it, right? With consumers, is it almost like they don't need to know because they're so used to, hey, does it work? I can one click, right? It's kind of like 
going from dial up to broadband, I just need it to work. I don't necessarily need to know which blockchain, but that it's working. You it's know, that's a great point. I think um, crypto native people think differently than the average yep. consumer. Right. Um, I don't know if you want to call this a consumer uh, of of blockchain and crypto. But yeah, that is the ultimate dream for a technology provider mm -hmm. uh, in the early stages to, to become like uh, the underlying rails and abstract everything away so things just run smoothly so that the end user doesn't even think about it. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things, a, a theme that you'll probably see this year is better UI UX throughout the space. Because without that, you're not going to invite the new people who like the quirkiness of us crypto native, who enjoy the crypto native quirkiness and hardness to do things, whereas they want ease. They want it. This is why PayPal subsidizes. You know, underneath the hood of a lot of things that happen at PayPal, it's pretty messy. But to you, the consumer, you have no idea. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, it, it's it, there's uh, so many parallels uh, to dial-up days of the internet and where we are at web 1.0 and uh and then where we need to go so it, it's it's kind of you lose some of that um sentimental aspect of it right the early adopters but to get to the next billion users you need to make it easy uh because not Listen, that is such a great point um you know the internet web 1.0 if you call it the original internet was supposed to be decentralized it was supposed to be, you know, um, different servers, different places, and, you know, um, standards started being created. Maybe it wasn't the best standard, but it was a standard that uh, evolved because it was, you know, there was enough um, liftoff uh, network effect or power loss started taking effect and, and things started getting, you know, built on TCP IP or what, whatever around it. Um, what happened was, though, it was still quirky. And for it to really, really um, take off to the masses in the later part of the adoption cycle, what happened in Web 2.0 is these today behemoths, but uh, back then, centralized companies like a Facebook or Amazon or, or Google started building functionality. And the user kind of traded off privacy for and, um, and ownership of their own data for convenience and made it very useful. So I think of Web3, the third generation, almost bringing back some of the first generation of the internet spirit, mm. more decentralization. And, and I'm not one of those people that say you need to like crush um, Amazon or Facebook <laughs> or Google because they're behemoths and they're too big and they own your life. So let's develop a solution that is as good or almost as good so people have a choice. And then I think, you know, we talked about, you know, the uh, the wallet and the blockchain as a great CRM tool. Think about the the um, Web3 wallet as the inverse of cookies on your computer. Mm -hmm. um, it's a profile, it's data that you own, and you get to opt in or choose and how that data gets moved around. You don't have to opt into that movie with the Barbie Phi Digital NFT at that, you know, um, AMC, Regal, whatever theater, a Cinemark theater, or whatever it is, you mm -hmm. choose. And then, you know, companies have been around a long time, like uh, Brave Browser, they allow you to choose. And if you choose, they the, the advertisers effectively pay you for your data. So, but, you know, in fairness, it's still clunky. It hasn't taken off yet. And I think one of the themes this year will be something's going to take off and it's going to be because not only is the underlying infrastructure like an avalanche layer one is ready for it, but because people are creating great UI, UX, so it's seamless to the end user. Now, on the note of, you know, you controlling your data because of the blockchain and, and uh, Web3 uh, setup, do you foresee in the future people being able to, like you were saying, sell their information to businesses and earn off of that. In addition, they're not only their, maybe their activity data as well, like uh, what they want to do. Your digital and, fingerprint, yeah. your digital fingerprint. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think that will be in the future. But before we get there, the um, if it's your social information, um, and and there are some social apps you know launching this year that may take off and do really well mm -hmm. um and have the network effects 
it has to get to the point where there is that network effect. There is a, you know, a, a enough people, critical mass of people, and it's got to be user friendly enough before it could compete. And then once that happens, I think people will really enjoy having sovereignty and self-sovereignty and owning their digital fingerprint and being able to use it as they choose. Mm. Now, there was news, I believe it was from last year, the uh, partnership between Avalabs and Amazon Web Services with plans to expand enterprise and government use of blockchain tech. Tell us about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Amazon is a, is a great partner of ours. They, um, you know, I just spoke at the Amazon reInvent and it was fantastic because I got to meet all these Web2 um, companies and their digital heads trying to figure out how they can deploy various technology solutions using a Web3 construct. So it, was, it was a great, great conference. Obviously, this year was mostly about AI, but, you know, the, the Web3 stuff was really fantastic as well. Um, so Amazon and um, and us, uh, Ava Labs, have a great partnership because uh, we help them with emerging, you know, crypto companies or developers that need compute power and storage for Amazon Web Services. Amazon Web Services has a large swath of existing users, obviously, one of the largest you know, cloud service providers. And they introduce us to um, call it um, uh, traditional enterprises that want to deploy blockchain enabled solutions. So it's a very synergistic relationship. You're referring to the specific government stuff. So a lot of um, government agencies, government related entities have their compute power and storage in Amazon Web Services. Mm -hmm. And since we we did something with Deloitte, basically with Deloitte as uh, end customer FEMA, an agency going, you know, disaster recovery agency of the United States, yeah. has created a uh, application on Avalanche to enable the workflow efficiency and moving of, um, call it information in terms of, um, claims at, during a disaster in real time mm -hmm. so you know victims need money in real time if if a hurricane happens and it's been very inefficient deloitte thinks that you can literally save 50 percent if you deploy it through their solution for fema um and they cite you know, hurricane katrina in 2005 or six mm -hmm. you know some agencies are still paying um, some of these contractors that are not even doing anything anymore. It's kind of like your subscription to an app that you forget and you just keep paying $2 a month for a long time. So same thing like that, whereas a blockchain solution encoded into the rules will end that at the right time. So um, because of that experience, Amazon Web Services working with us to introduce us to other government related related agencies or companies to help create solutions for them as well. That's great, and I love that use case uh, with Deloitte and FEMA uh, because th th there's so many complications happening there. Like you saying, people not getting paid on time, um, uh, and and then you have fraud sometimes and all kinds of things. But with the blockchain, it will eliminate a lot of those pitfalls. I mean, with, you know, government agencies, you know, there are, there's natural upgrade cycles that they need to do. So if they're going to upgrade, might as well upgrade to a Web3 solution as opposed to uh, some intermittent solution. So it's kind of like emerging markets, uh, a penetration of mobile phones was far faster than the U.S. because U.S. has such a great landline. So it's a great uh, way to work and help agencies in the U.S., since we're talking about government, are there any governments that are piloting or testing CBDCs or stable coins on, on Avalanche? So we talked about stable coins already a little bit. I think that is clearly a product uh, market fit type of situation. Um, CBDCs are two types. There's the retail and there is the, um, call it the B2B or the wholesale kind. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm very torn on CBDC. Um, you're taking the best of blockchain technology removing the, sometimes removing the transparency, making it closed and enabling governments to leverage the technology and making things more centralized in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of thought needs to be put into it. I do think that there will be um, CBDCs at various countries that use the technology for their benefit. Sure. Um, I just hope that there's also a decentralized version, maybe that is Bitcoin, maybe that is you know stable coins, whatever it is, that allows um, individuals to maintain a, 
good balance of, health, uh, of privacy and freedom while uh, um, not doing any um, illicit activity. Yeah, absolutely agree with you. And that's, I know, a lot of debate happening uh, here in the United States. At least I'm hoping it can align to the U.S. Constitution where our right to privacy and our rights are maintained. But, um, you know, hard to tell what's going to happen in other countries as these get rolled out. And hopefully the U.S. Um, has a lot to lose with this um, if um, others to do things. And, and, you know, because the dollar is like the medium of exchange for 60 to 70 percent of the trade in the U.S., Mm -hmm. um you know they they need to think about it what happens if it becomes some sort of stable coin that becomes the medium of exchange around the world mm -hmm. yeah that's and uh, yeah there's so many complications there with the future of the us dollar and res as a reserve currency and so forth um now tell us about interoperability uh with other blockchains and uh which you know if you can tell us the top of your head because maybe there might be a lot but tell us about that well You know, we believe in a multi-chain world. We don't think it's going to be a winner-take-all type of thing. It's going to be, a, a, you know, not many, many, but it will be a select group that um, are able to, like, provide the functionality and have the technology innovation that's necessary to carry on daily transactions at a necessary speed or scale. Um, but... We're very, I mean, first of all, Avalanche um, is, uh, has an EVM, um, so it's Ethereum compatible. Assets can move back and forth. We've done three or four things, actually, Avalabs, a company, to help Avalanche be interoperable with other um, chains. One is there are definitely bridges that connect Avalanche, the blockchain, to other chains. Mm -hmm. Um The wallets that are being created are also interoperable. And the subnets that we talked about earlier, they are also um, interoperable with each other. So everything is set up so that the subnets can talk to each other, can talk to the Avalanche C chain, and then can also talk to Ethereum, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so I think ultimately this is also why JP Morgan and Apollo and Providence uh, or Figure wanted to figure out a way to do that you know, project with Avalanche and other players with Layer Zero was in there. I think Axelar was in there as well, because that's where you, you know, in this world of tokenized assets, you need liquidity. And if you have just these siloed, you know, ponds, if you will, you're not connecting them, you won't have as much liquidity as you need. So I think it's super important that you do have interoperability. Mm. Now, you've touched on quite a few things that will be coming this year. Anything else you want to highlight that's on your roadmap for 2024? Great. So, um, you know, there's two ways I look at a roadmap. There's the technology roadmap and there is the, um, call it, uh, business collaboration partnerships. Sure. And there's also internal efforts as well. So, um, on the technology roadmap, we talked about a few of them already. There's a thing called teleporter. that will enhance the interoperability of um, subnet to subnet. That's super important. Um, then there is, we talked about Bricks, Bricks and um, uh, Hyper SDK and also Firewood that will allow the large-scale transactions. Mm -hmm. And then there's also uh, an effort in place to minimize the validator requirements so that um, you know, more people can validate at a cheaper cost. So those are three on the technology side that I'm super excited about in the next quarter to two quarters. Um, on the business development side, number one thing is to get those 80 plus subnets live, working with those you know, developers, to give them the solutions they need to take it live. So there are some gaming companies we talked about earlier, AAA publishers like Godzilla, Shrapnel, Uh, TSM is one of the largest esports wallet companies out there. Those are things that we're very excited. Unfortunately, in TraFi, I can't talk about because they are very heavy on the NDAs. Yeah. Um, um, but there are other, call it TraFi type crossover solutions similar to what we did with JP Morgan, Apollo, and others that are super exciting. You know, big picture, they all revolve around tokenization of alternative assets. or um, making settlement much faster. And, and, and they're using the benefits there to be able to provide services for more people. Mm -hmm. um, and then lastly, 
Um, again, brands are also very specific with their NDAs, but we yeah. talked about this a little bit. Um, there are some creative ways where people are going to uh, use the NFT so that it's no longer just from a Web2 perspective, negative connotation for some digital cartoon, uh, real utility yeah. and uh, a, you know engagement with their customers. Yeah, that's great. And I think utility is a key there with the NFT market. Don't get me wrong. There's a collectible aspect to it. but I have no problem with people yeah. wanting to collect. I mean, back in the day, I'm sure people thought collecting baseball cards were silly and, and strange as well. Why should there be value to baseball cards? Um, yeah. Anyway, that, that's all. That's a different you know, philosophical debate. But I am excited for brands that will be using this construct to create use cases. And lastly, we didn't get to finish talking about what we're doing internally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, last year we created a great DevRel team um, and we've seen developers come on, hackathons, and there's a program we're launching called Codebase, which is an accelerator program for developers to come in and get help from Ava Labs people and create, um, you know, it's kind of like modeled itself a little bit to Y Combinator, and but it's going to be very, very good for creating crypto native developers to launch stuff on uh, Avalanche. That's great. And I, I love that you, you seem very organized and you broke it down uh, with, where it's, uh, you know, easy to understand what you guys are doing internally versus well, just how I think about everything. <laughs> it's compartmentalized because we are trying to attack two markets at once, if you will. For sure. Um, a question just came to mind. Um, what are your thoughts on the conversions of AI and blockchain. Um, given that AI is on the rise, we're seeing deep fakes, um, and I think blockchain may be a solution there. Are you guys exploring use cases or solutions around that? Um, so we are working with third parties that are. Mm -hmm. um, you know, right now, I think reality is AI will help Web3 first before Web3 can help AI. Mm -hmm. I think AI will enable. Um, faster and better coding in smart contracts. Mm -hmm. It can do a lot of the security uh, checks for smart contracts that is necessary in the space. Um, and it can also help analyze on-chain data right. much better and faster. I think that is really the first step. Well, actually there's even an uh, earlier first step. I mean, even us internally, we've been using things like DALI and saving money to create, you know, images and logos, et cetera, et cetera. And there's other applications we've been using. So that, you know, applying it to daily use cases, that's really the first step. Second step is what we just talked about, helping create better con smart contracts, secure smart contracts, uh, analyzing on-chain data. One of the problems with AI going forward is what you talked about. And this is when Web3 will help AI, in my opinion. You know, you need provenance of that data set. You need provenance of the language, large language models and a track record. That can all be done through a blockchain enabled solution. And that will help um, AI in the long run. People trust AI. So deep fakes and stuff like that will at least be known um, for, for the user. Mm, great point. I, I love how you uh, phrase that, that, you know, uh, AI will have to help Web3 and, and crypto initially, but then vice versa as we, as we progress. I love that. Um, let's talk about the crypto market at large with the time we have left. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on the Bitcoin spot ETF launches and what impact that will have on the future of this industry? Well, I think it's a great success. Um, you know, I'm an operator, but I can tell you from an operator's perspective, just having BlackRock in there and Fidelity in there the tone of conversation for biz dev to, uh, partnerships with other enterprises or TradFi has already changed. Um, there is a sense of that there is new leadership and there is endorsement from respected people in the space. So it enables the, call it um, adoption from a technology perspective, not just from an asset perspective. Mm -hmm. And I think um, it's going to take time, but the early numbers already show some great success. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Really, I think what people will be talking about in a few months on the asset side will be um, Ethereum and other um, alternative assets and when those will be available in a more uh, easily usable form. You know, that's form factor right there. The, the You know, the ETF or ETP, frankly, it's ETP, not ETF. It's a big distinguish. 
um, it's important to distinguish that, has mm -hmm. already been helpful. And then that creates adoption. When those users first experience what that means, and then they start researching and understanding what the technology is about, I would love for them to go in and actually go into the ecosystem of Avalanche and try Trader Joe or try Ave and for yield and, and you know, lend and borrow, or one day buy a tokenized HELOC loan um, in a more efficient manner. So I think that's the first step. And I think it's already great at uh, creating call it endorsement from trusted figures so that you can cross over and grow the adoption cycle. Mm. And one of the things that we're still waiting for in the US is full comprehensive crypto regulations. And um, that is balanced, of course. Uh, there's still a lot of debate happening with the SEC. There's a couple of bills in the House as well as Senate. Um, what is your outlook as an, you know someone who's building in, in the industry? And are you optimistic we may see something either this year or next year? I'm optimistic we'll see something next year. I think there's a lot of things going on this year, um, you know, until there's a, a settled, you know, less volatile in terms of like who's who's running the show. Um, it's going to be hard. Um, there's a lot of other things on people's minds in, in Congress. But I think if there's one area that may come sooner than other areas, and we touched upon this, it'll be some sort of stable coin legislation. I think um, there was, you know, I read the headlines today, there was uh, a uh, senator or, or congressman somewhere today in the U.S. that mentioned, you know, they want to push along their stable coin uh, regulation. I think because it is an area that people realize is getting huge adoption around the world, yeah. the U.S. may be forced to move faster. And it also, we talked about this earlier, like the medium exchange is the dollar right now for global trade. Um, the U.S. needs to be thinking about this and not fall behind that in case something else comes up. Mm, yeah, great. Um, John, final item here before we hit the wrap-up question. I'm still struggling with DeFi. I believe in DeFi, but I'm seeing, you know, there's still these exploits that are happening. Where we do you feel in the timeline? And, you know, what is... I, is, I hope I'm phrasing, phrasing this right. You know, what's the iteration? What's the timeline for when we get past a lot of these exploits happening in DeFi? So I think if you look at dollars and you look at exploits, they are decreasing over time. Mm -hmm. um, ironically, um, when you have these massive growth in 2020, 2021, security audits and other things probably, and, and the go-to-market of some of these dApps were pre probably rushed. Um, because so in a downturn actually allows a lot of the new developers to take their time and, you know, uh, make sure their code is, is better and secure. Um, and the audit, you know, firms out there, security audit firms out there have fewer clients and are able to take more time. So it's already decreasing. Like we said earlier, there will be very shortly, I think, an AI enabled solution to accelerate that even more. So it's already happening. But there's another path to this as well. And this is what we talked about with the Spruce Network with Wellington, T. Row and Wisdom Tree, which mm -hmm. is basically an institutionalized version of DeFi, where if you can KYC AML, you can do the same functionality um, as you would in a traditional DeFi, but with different types of assets in a tokenized form. So I think that's why it's so important to continue to push on the crossover side, because that's another solution to making this space really usable for people and not worry about these, you know, uh, illicit issues and, you know, responses from bad actors. Yeah. And, and like, to your point, like uh, patients, I think definitely need to hear and uh, the builders who are doing these things, not rushing through uh, and taking their time. Um, and we'll get there. I, I just we'll get there. I mean, you just don't know when. I mean, there are parallels with the original internet too. Um, I mean, in the early days, the internet itself was full of scams and frauds and illicit activity. Um, it was not until you know Al Gore claims he invented the internet. He didn't really invent the internet. What he did was he pushed the bill through uh, Congress that created standards on how commerce will happen on the internet. And that really led to legitimate players coming into the space and using the internet, so to speak. Same is happening in Web3. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Because I remember certain things I did as a teenager on Web 1.0, uh, which 
yeah, I can't stay, but it was point is I was able to exploit certain things because it was in its early phases, its early iteration, but it improved over time. So maybe I, I helped to improve the security on the internet. I don't know. I'm sure you did. <laughs> All right. Wrap up questions. If you could create your own metaverse, what would the theme be? Okay. So I'm very focused on the underlying technology and providing that. So I wouldn't create my own metaverse. We want to invite other people to create metaverses. You mm -hmm. know, working at companies like Lamina One, they are creating a great metaverse experience on top of Avalanche. We're working with other third parties that are creating metaverses. Um, I can say the one I would be interested in using would be the one that creates the experience that is as most similar in a digital construct as it is in your traditional life. I don't know what that is, but if, once I see it, I'll know. Mm. Rapid fire questions. Favorite food? Ah, um, you know, I'm a very simple guy. I, I generally like just steaks, uh, potatoes. Um, I think when I want to be healthy, though, and I'm trying to become more and more healthy, it's not the steaks. It's more of, um, I wouldn't say vegan, but like I will have avocado for protein and, and, and things like that. Favorite musician or band? Ooh, um, Pearl Jam. You know, that's someone, uh, a, a group that I've liked for a long, long time. Yeah, I love music. I don't even know if some of the younger audience will know them, but they're <laughs> legendary rockers. Oh, yeah. Uh, favorite movie? Huh. Well, the, um, it's changed over time, but, you know, the last one that I thought was incredible was, uh, and it was the first time I watched it in a movie theater in a long time, was Top Gun Maverick. Um, and I think it's great because very rarely do you see a sequel that you can argue and say is better than the original and a sequel that comes out 30 plus years later. Yeah. Yeah. It was very good. Uh, favorite book. Well, right now I'm reading, um, a friend of mine, uh, wrote, uh, web three, Alex Tapscott. So I'm actually uh, helping him on his web tour. Alex and his father have, um, done a lot of uh, good writing in the space to help educate everyone in the space way back when for 10 plus years. Alex in this book really does a great job of talking about uh, future uses of Web3 and the benefits of that. So I would encourage people to check that book out. Um, another book that I'm reading right now is um, by a Stanford professor, Matt Abrams, you know, um, Think Faster, Talk Smarter. It's basically a communications book. And, um, you know, as part of a, as a leader, as a, as a president of a company, uh, um, you have to know how to communicate people and understand other people, especially if I'm trying to do crossover between Web 2 and Web 3. You need to understand the mindset of others. I will definitely check out that book. That sounds uh, pretty good. Um, and finally, what do you do for a hobby? Oh, I love sports. So like I said earlier, I still am very active in playing tennis, um, uh, lifting weights, doing, um, uh, I play a lot of golf in the summer when, when it's warm. So racquetball sports, as well as, uh, weightlifting. And, um, you know, during COVID I rode a lot of uh, Peloton. So mm -hmm. I continued to ride, you know, stationary bicycles. John, absolute pleasure chatting with you. Uh, I'm excited for the future updates of Avalanche this year. Uh, thank you for joining me. Thank you. Thank you.